Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. Today I am actually going to be talking you through something that is very personal to me and I know affects many, many people out there but they don't know where to start or they don't know how to correct this particular problem. And I'm going to talk today about gut dysfunction and specifically for this presentation, SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Now I had this problem occur to me twice over the period of my life so far. And unfortunately SIBO is one of those things that can come back and bite you again later on in life if you don't look after your diet and don't take care of yourself. So I wanted to cover this with you today because it's something that is quite prevalent in today's society, having a lot of stress in our lives, foods and dietary choices can make this problem happen more. And I think there's lots of people out there that don't actually realize they've got SIBO. They may have been misdiagnosed with IBS or they may just be told that they're bloated and they may be blaming it on other things. So I want to cover today in a kind of presentation format. And this is something that I normally talk to my coaching clients about. And this presentation is something that I normally go through with them. But I wanted to share with it today on my channel because because I just want to help as many people as I can with this particular problem. So I'm going to jump into a kind of presentation style of format. If you like this video or get anything from it, or if you've got any questions to ask me, please write them in the comments. Please give this video a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed to my channel, get subscribing. And I'm going to do more of this kind of content if you find it useful. So please give me some feedback and that'll really help me out. So let's get into today's presentation. So to start this off, what we're going to look at is what SIBO is. So you know, understand why it happens and, and how it kind of forms within the gut. Um, some of the symptoms, so there's a bunch of different symptoms that can affect SIBO clients or SIBO uh, patients as such, and it could be that you've got some of these symptoms. And that's not, that's not to say that you've got SIBO, it could be that you've got other potential problems, but um, I'm specifically focusing on SIBO today, and, and the protocols that I'm going to mention to you would help you with general gut dysfunction anyway. Um, how to test for it, so if you really want to go down that route, um, I can talk to you about some of the testing that's involved, and also some supplementation and basic sort of food protocols that you can follow if you've got really any kind of gut dysfunction this would help but I'm going to again specifically focus on SIBO uh, so hopefully you're going to find that fairly useful so as I already mentioned um, SIBO stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth now what generally happens within a uh, within a digestive system is that when you eat your food food goes down into the stomach and the stomach acid helps break down that food known as HCL or hydrochloric acid, breaks down that food and it's then passed into the intestinal tract. Now within the intestinal tract, a bunch of functions obviously happen where the food is broken down and we start to absorb some of the nutrients within that food. Uh, and that starts to happen in the small intestine. Uh, eventually that food will then move through into the large intestine and in our large intestine we have again another bunch of functions that happen for example we'll have um, our uh, fat soluble vitamins will be created and um, we'll have butyrate and short chain fatty acids produced and this is all part of a healthy digestive system now in order for that to actually happen we have got a larger number of commensal bacteria that live in the large intestine and 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 that what will happen is in a SIBO case or a SIBO patient is that bacterial overgrow from the large intestine and go into the small intestine where we don't want them and you can see on the left hand side picture we've kind of got a healthy gut a healthy intestinal tract where there's a right balance of bacteria but on the right hand side we've got this overgrowth and you can see that where there's some redness there's some inflammation and the small intestine has got too much bacteria now why does that happen well we've got some preventative measures that can stop SIBO from happening in the first place so as I mentioned in the in the stomach you've got hydrochloric acid which kind of prevents that overgrowth because it kills it off before it gets to the gut um, but then within the small intestine we have a bunch of enzymes known as brush border enzymes that help to help break down kind of complex carbohydrates and promote absorption so when those things start to deteriorate it is where we can find um, SIBO happens so uh, you know you might have had things like antibiotics uh, you might have had a very very stressful lifestyle uh, you may have eaten foods that irritate your gut and destroy some of those things it could be that you've got low stomach acid so there's a bunch of different things that can happen that can cause SIBO which can then cause this imbalance now as it mentions on this slide 
Um, it, it's not necessarily pathogenic bacteria. So as I mentioned, when you eat something that is potentially bad for you or contains bad bacteria, the hydrochloric acid in your, your stomach should you know, potentially kill it off. But if it doesn't, it can go into your, into your small intestine and into your large intestine and cause a bacterial overgrowth. So it can be pathogenic, but it can also be from an abundance of good bacteria. So we've all heard of probiotics and you know people supplement with probiotics or things like kefir and kimchi foods that are high in, in prebiotics the foods that that uh, microbiome actually eat um, it can also be created from an imbalance of those bacteria as well so you can imagine it's very very hard to maintain this balance because it could be an overgrowth from bad bacteria but it can also be um, good bacteria that we need in our gut that's just become overgrown as well so it's almost like taking care of a garden right so you've got to make sure that the, the garden's nicely kept trim and in balance otherwise things can go crazy and overgrow and you end up with trees and bushes and things everywhere and it's a bit like that in your gut as well what we can find that happens is that depending on the type of bacteria that is in abundance they obviously feed off the foods that we eat so they can imagine the foods are going into the gut and the bacteria are then living off those foods that we eat and depending on the species of bacteria can depend on what then happens next. Now in this picture you can see there's, you know, there's gas being produced and it can either be hydrogen, uh, a methane or it can be a combination of hydrogen sulfide. So the different bacteria ferment the food that we eat and that's what produces gas. So you can imagine that fermentation actually producing gas that is then um, going into our into our, our stomach, uh, sorry into our gut and then we end up being bloated or having wind and uh, and that's uh, kind of some of the symptoms of having SIBO or SIBO based um, uh, problems. So what happens when this kind of overgrowth takes place? Well first of all it interferes with the function of the small intestine uh, and we saw sure before that picture that we have food that comes in from our stomach into the small intestine initially. So in the small intestine we have a, a process that takes place where food is absorbed and digested in a healthy individual and with SIBO because we've got this overgrowth well they can actually destroy some of the enzymes that the small intestine needs which helps break down the carbohydrates and sugars that we eat um, and, and that can then lead to obviously digestive issues and, and malabsorption. Now that malabsorption is also created because effectively they're creating this gas, this fermentation and this fermentation is from the foods that we're eating so they're effectively stealing our food uh, to fuel this process and that can lead to again malabsorption um, because we're not um, producing some of the, the, the vitamins and, and nutrients that we require to be healthy you know, individuals. Um, they also increase a thing known as uh, zonulin levels in our gut. So um, zonulin is it controls what we can we, we refer to as the tight junctions of the gut. If you imagine in your gut you've got finger like protrusions that stick out with very very fine hairs on them and as food passes through they cling on to these little hairs on these little finger like protrusions and they, they are absorbed into the digestive system or absorbed into our bloodstream. Now what will happen is when you've got SIBO or you've got damaging bacteria they can do what's called as blunt borders or damage the these little finger-like protrusions in your gut which then stop you from absorbing and digesting food properly and that turns into a problem known as leaky gut which I'll probably cover in another video because uh, that's something that I also suffered with due to my SIBO and leaky gut is where you get foods effectively going into the bloodstream that are undigested and shouldn't be there and your body then responds to that by attacking them and actually creating inflammation and, and all sorts of other problems. Um, we can also then create things such as endotoxins. So all this um, bacteria um, create what's known as endotoxins which are potentially poisonous to our body which can also result in uh, more symptoms. So you can imagine it's creating a whole host of problems that are then causing us to downregulate our gut and downregulate the function of our gut as well. So how do you know whether you've got SIBO or not? Well as you can see there's a whole bunch of different symptoms that can occur um, if you have got SIBO and that's because of this combination of things that we've mentioned. So you may suffer from bloating, you may find that after you eat certain foods or certain meals your stomach feels quite distended, um, you may feel uncomfortable, you may find your jeans are slightly tighter uh, and that's because of this gas that's being produced right so there's gases coming through hydrogen, methane or hydrogen sulfide 
and that's creating this bloating. You may start to burp a lot. Uh, you may find that you've got wind. You may even have pain in your gut. So you may have this kind of abdominal pain. Now, just talking about that, some of these symptoms you can probably see reading through this list um, are very, very closely related to um, IBS. And that's because the, the symptoms are very, very characteristic of irritable bowel syndrome. So you may go to the doctor and speak to them and say, look, I've got all these problems. And they may go, well, actually, you've got IBS. But actually, you haven't got IBS. You've actually got SIBO. So the protocol that they're going to give you to help you with your IBS is probably not going to help you in the long run because you've got SIBO. So you might have this kind of similar symptoms such as you know, ab abdominal distension, flatulence, um, acid reflux, diarrhea, constipation. They're all SIBO symptoms, but actually they're also closely related to irritable bowel. And, and I think the, they found that um, 50 to 84% of IBS cases uh, are actually um, the underlying cause is SIBO, not IBS. So that's something to bear in mind if you have been diagnosed with IBS, uh, but nothing you've tried has actually worked. Um, you can also end up with a bunch of food intolerances. So certain foods are obviously going to create um, um, more discomfort in your gut because it could actually heighten the SIBO that you've got. Uh, you might end up with joint pain. Why? Because SIBO creates inflammation in the body and that leads to kind of joint pain, um, aches and pains when you wake up in the morning. Um, you might find that you're tired. Why? Because you've got malabsorption. You're not absorbing the nutrients properly in your food. You're also not creating the relevant fat soluble vitamins and butyrate and, and all the kind of good stuff that you need from a healthy diet. So you could end up with problems like that. Um, I said diarrhea is fairly common, skin issues, so a symptom could be that you end up with a rash or a skin flare-up that you can't get rid of through trying various creams and various other things. Why? Because it's an internal issue. It's something that's happening within your gut. Um, you may also get nausea and vomiting. You may feel sick um, fairly often. So you can see there's a whole host of different symptoms that can happen if you have SIBO, but they are very, very closely related to IBS. So it's definitely worth checking it out if you think that you've um, not had any resolve with your IBS, because it could be that you've got SIBO instead. So you think you've probably got SIBO, as you've kind of confirmed with some of those symptoms and you just generally want to start a protocol where you can start to feel better. Now, I strongly recommend that if you have got any kind of gut dysfunction, that you follow a low FODMAP diet. Now, a low FODMAP diet, also known as elimination diet, is effectively cutting out certain sugars that can irritate your gut or feed that bacteria that we mentioned before. And by cutting that out, you're gonna find that you're gonna get a, a lot low, lower levels of gas produced, which means your body can have time to heal and repair itself. Now, that's dependent on the type of SIBO that you've got, um, and it also depends on the type of gut dysfunction you've got. But I always recommend as a good starting point for at least a month or two months following a low FODMAP diet. Now, if you haven't got a clue about low FODMAP, Google it and just look, look one up. But also I recommend a, um, a, an app that you can download on your Android or iPhone called the Monash University um, Low FODMAP Diet app, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, I use that with a lot of clients because it allows you to see the volumes of food that you can eat. So certain foods are classed as low FOD, uh, are low FOD and certain foods are classed as high FOD, um, which means you have to avoid them. But certain foods sit in the middle where you can have a certain amount, but you can't go over that, otherwise it classes as being high FODMAP. So the, the app allows you to search for foods and fruits and things like that and see what you can potentially eat, what you can't eat, and what you can have a little bit of, uh, until uh, which, which may affect your gut in a positive way. So I strongly recommend that you do that um, if that fails after a couple of months and you're still struggling then I would recommend potentially testing now testing is something I do as I'm a functional diagnostic practitioner and if you message me I can point you in the right direction uh, but it's it's um, a not the best test in the world. It can be quite annoying because um, it's very, very long-winded. It requires a certain amount of fasting uh, the night before. And then the test itself is three hours long. So you have to test yourself every 20 minutes. And it's a breath test that involves you breathing into a test tube and actually capturing your breath after taking a sugar solution, a lactose solution, which will then start creating this fermentation process. And then we can measure the levels of gases produced. The problem is with that test, 
test, it's not super accurate and you can end up with false positives or false negatives as well. Um, so it's not great. So then you need, then need to move on to something a bit more aggressive and something that's going to help uh, replenish and dest well destroy initially some of the bad bacteria and actually get things into balance. And I'm going to cover that on the next video. So on the next video, I'm going to talk about um, some of the supplements you can take and also some of the dietary changes that you can take that may help with this particular problem. Um, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please comment in the comments below on any questions you might have, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, and, and this is a new set of videos that I'm going to do on the kind of gut and, and overall health and well-being, as I've commonly done review videos on products that I buy, but this is a big part of my life as well, and I like to help people. So um, let me know in the comments if you found this useful, and I'll catch you on the next video.